so uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Tomasz Drobny and here's a Danny Horn. Woo! <laughs> um, we are working for Wikia, uh, which probably some of you knows. Who's know the Wikia here? Yeah. Yay. Oh yeah, that's pretty pretty much everyone. <laughs> so for those who don't know Wikia, um, we are the wiki hosting. We host hundred thousands of small wikis with a fairly small community and a very focus, very subject focus uh, content. Um, so which which wikis are are you guys from? Yeah. Which, which ones wiki do you are know? You guys from? People raised their hand a minute ago. I'm from Magic Lantern. Magic Lantern? That's awesome. Okay. Well, I'm not from there, but I like that one. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes. Call of Duty. Call of Duty, one of our favorites. <laughs> They're all our favorites. They're all beautiful. Anyone else? Anyone else? Fallout. Oh, Fallout. Fallout. Oh, that's like really a, one of our favorites wiki. All the bugs listed in the game. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. For every mission. Yeah, some of these wikis are really amazing. You're an editor or just, just reader? Uh, just a reader. Most okay. I, I, are you using the chat on the Fallout? Because they, they, no. they love Fallout, Fallout yeah, loves the chat. Okay, so we know each other already. Um, <laughs> we can go forward with that. So everyone who want to try a chat right now, communitywikia.com, we got special chat, and you will see something like that when you will go there. And there are our people there. You can speak to them. It's a communitywikia.com slash wiki slash special chat. So community is sort of our main central hub for all of Wikia. It's where people go for support and then also come to ask questions, talk to each other. So yeah, C came here and right? see our stuff. Okay, so let's go forward with the presentation. Um, so over the time, our community start uh, using some chat tools uh, and Dana as project manager and a bunch of other engineers were looking on these tools and trying to find out the solution uh, for everyone because every wiki basically uh, have their own words of, of, of chatting. And um, I gathered a few like most popular examples how people were doing it pr before the chat. One thing was, uh, was MIRC um, used by Wikia Runscape, for example. This is actually a screenshot from Wikipedia, uh, which is our <laughs> wiki. Um, and another thing was Call of Duty. Um, another thing was Call of Duty. Uh, they had a little bit better solution. They actually embedded the IRC chat into their wiki wi with a JavaScript uh, application. It's it's better solution, but still uh, was missing one one important thing. We we wanted to people actually have the same privileges, the same uh, the same um, user right as uh, on uh, on wiki, and also we want to reflect some of the stuff which happens on the uh, on the chat in the wiki. Uh, so here's the other solution. Uh, that is an uh, article comment which we have on a bunch of wikis, for example, Glee. And they start to using it as a, as a chat during the episodes. So, so this number is not really that big for the, those episode uh, pages. Sometimes it's in 10,000s of, of comments and this is just a live, live, live chatting about the, the episode. Another solution which we actually built, which wasn't that bad, uh, which wasn't that good, was the, sorry for that, <laughs> uh, was this shout box. Um, no one was using that. It, you didn't see who is there. Like, it was just, just not that good solution. Um, and so, so product guys and, and Danny and a bunch of engineers came out with this idea of product with will, which will be perfect for our, our wiki. And that's the least. Needs to be easy and powerful. Needs to integrate with MediaWiki. As I mentioned, permissions need to be easy to find. Uh, need to 
not interfere with wiki editing and we build it so uh, first thing on every of our wiki which have a chat enable we see this um, We see this right rage mo module with list of people who are currently on the chat. This is the community wiki. 21 people is chatting. You can scroll, see who, who is that. Uh, join the chat from, from that point. Also, this looks similar, but it's slightly bit different. Uh, we deliver this, uh, this, oh, this tag. Yeah, uh, we deliver this tag. So if you want to embed it, actually the chat entry point in the article, you're just putting it here and that's also work. Um, so yeah, if you found your chat, you can enter and here you are. Uh, this is the list of the people. It looks like any other chat. Um, the, your username on the wiki is a username on the, on the chat. So here's, also, you can run a private conversation with, with any people on the chat, and that's the only place actually on Wikia where you can run private conversation, um, which I think it's pretty interesting. I, I think the Wikipedia still doesn't have such a possibility. Every, everything is public. Okay, so as I said, we uh, integrated the user rights with the chat. So the people who, who are more powerful on the wiki, like admins uh, or staff of Wikia, have this extra option. One of these options, give a chat, chat mode status, it gives you some extra privileges. It's not equal to being an admin on the wiki, but you have, you have extra powers in the chat. You can kick people, so if someone is annoying, you can come down him, just, just normal, basically, Typical, uh, typical chat thing, um, and you can see that just by clicking on the uh, yeah by, by clicking on the name in the user list, then it just brings that up as a little contextual menu. Yeah, um, who want to be kicked? <laughs> Any volunteers? <laughs> Which one? <laughs> oh no, this is I think our user. <laughs> <laughs> he only wants to kick friends. I don't know if he can, because Brayden's staff. No, I can't kick staff, unfortunately. Oh, All right, don't kick him, just show. OK, <laughs> so so when you kick someone or no volunteers to be kicked, no. OK, so if you kick someone uh, or ban someone, that's reflect in MediaWiki. So that's your contribution page. There's an information that you have been banned. Admins and staff can change the ban or cancel the ban. There is also this information in our global, uh, in, in a profile mask head, uh, banned from chat. And um, you also see this in the, in the logs. Yes? Uh, admins. No, actually, I think, isn't that just staff? Yeah, it's, just a, it's a new staff tool that we've got. And this so is, this is the, the, pro the part of our, our uh, profile page, and it's, but that actually that new tab, the managed user tab, that's just a new staff thing. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, and as we mentioned, we didn't want to chat interfere with the editing, so yeah, it's, it's open in separate window. You can, you can still edit, you, you can chat. Uh, we see here a Glee wiki, one of our biggest wiki. Okay, so that's how feature looks. Because this is technical track, I want to speak a little bit about how we actually build it. We're trying to figure out what, what, what we need to have to, to build such a feature. So uh, it needs to work in real time. That, that's obvious for chat. It needs to work cross-browser. Need to be integrated with MediaWiki and needs to be easy to learn and maintained by our engineers. So we came out after some research with the list of tools which we are going to use to do that. Of course, we use MediaWiki because that was the requirement. We use uh, Node.js and Socket.io as a, as a, as a backend. We just use Redis as a database and Ganglia as a monitoring tool. So, <laughs> I want to go, 
who is here actually a technical engineer and how many people? Three, four. Okay, I just went for like <laughs> fast, say what we use. I. Okay, so what is Node? Node is a platform built on Chrome JavaScript runtime to easily, easily build fast scalable network application. Etc. Etc. And the keyword for us, real time. That's why we decided to use that, and also because it was uh, the the backend run on the JavaScript, which for us is, is a great benefit because most of our engineers are are a PHP and JavaScript developers. So so we we had this possibility to don't look for a new language, don't new, don't look for a new expertise, just just use what actually we know. And like this is a short summary about the node, as I said, fast and even even driven. Um, JavaScript on server and, and, and client side, persistent. Um, and the problem which we actually uh, experience with a, with a Node.js right now is that, that the Node.js is still actually in pretty experimental stage. Every almost two weeks there is a new update. There is a huge problems with memory leaking in the Node.js. Uh, the library are immature. Um, basically the IPI change of them and you can only use one core of your CPU with the node because it's a single thread. Um, but we solve this problem by simply. So um, I will skip this one. This is performance stats. I will basically it shows that PHP with the Apache is around three times slower than the Node.js in some circumstances. Um, that was um, so we use also Redis as a as, as a database backend. This is a short description. What I love about Redis is uh, this simple key value storage, but also have this powerful set of common which allow us to operate on the lists and sets, which in the chat is pretty important because we have a list of users, list list of of uh, messages. It's really help us to like find something, sort something, uh, and it's still very fast and very lightweight. Um, also, I, I put this simple comparison with speed between uh, Redis and MySQL, which show clearly that MySQL is slower. Uh, okay, so here's the thing, like how we put all these things together. Here's the MediaWiki server. Uh, the MediaWiki server communicate with the chat servers in here. So when user comes to MediaWiki, Maybe we could generate the unique authorization key and render the chat page. The chat page is connecting to the chat server. The chat server verify the key with a media wiki. And if the chat get a privilege to connect the user, it's connecting the user, broadcasting the information to a channel, and also broadcasting back information to media wiki to update this uh, right ray module uh, on the chat. And that's basically how it works. Um, Here's the interesting thing. We have two stacks. Uh, one is only a failover system. So this one operate all the time. There's a replication between Redis S1 and S2. In case of any failure, uh, we're just switching the, the, the servers and everything is going back to work. Also, in, on, on the single servers, we run more than one instance of Node to, to, to actually use all the cores of, of the of the machine. So in our case, it's two currently because we have two core machine. Um, so tell me, before you go on, maybe just to make sure that people want to ask for questions about. Does anyone have a question about it? So Is anyone interesting in this? <laughs> yes. No. Okay. Yeah. yeah. This looks like an extensive solution. It's just one machine, actually. Uh, this is actually four machines. <coughs> this is this is one machine with with the node server, and this is one machine uh, with the database. And this is a backup solution which we need to keep, which we need to have uh, in case of any emergency. Four machine is this uh, expensive solution? I don't know. The implementation actually took a while, uh, but I don't know. Um, not so what is what looks can expensive to you? Let's say you, you, have, you can have a thousand chats on four machines. Is that reasonable? 
No, it's actually we currently have uh, we currently have fifteen thousand charts on those on those, on those actually four machines. Yes. Yeah, actually you run all the time only on two machines, yeah, but in the case of emergency you're switching to the to the second serve. So because we are very cautious, we have this emergency server. Um, okay, any other questions? Yes. Was it only for performance reasons that you guys decided to use Node.js? No, as I say instead of just making a completely media with the extension. Um that wouldn't be actually possible. Um, the Apache server, cons like, if you want to write a real-time application with Apache, you would need to to uh, requesting Apache very often to, to get the messages in some um, time, which would be seems to be like real time for people. And Apache instances consume a lot of memory. The the media wiki actually the the run running of media wiki is around a hundred of megabytes of memory. I you know, in the time, I will show you uh, r later the statistic. We have so many connections that wouldn't be actually, that would kill our infrastructure. Because it, it just, just impossible. It's just impossible. Um, OK, so we use also this interesting tool. I, I really like it, a Ganglia tool, which help us to monitor the, the, the system. It's, it's designed to monitor the clusters or grids. And we're using it also for a chat. I just put together. Um, most of the of the things which we're trying to to keep eye on in the chat. So starting from here, that's the network usage, CPU usage, memory usage, as I mentioned, leaking. Uh, this is the number of people which connects um, right now. This is a number of requests sent to MediaWiki. This is a number of users connected at that time, which in here, it's basically. Our two servers currently uh, handle ar around uh, 1,019, uh, sorry, 1,900, uh, 1900 simultaneous connections. Um, so it's pretty big. Uh, this is a number of even broadcasted back to MediaWiki messages. Um, this, what is that? I don't remember right now. <laughs> Uh, this is a memory used by Redis database. This is the Redis database fragmentation. Uh, this is also memory usage, but different. Um, so yeah, we're trying to monitor everything what is possible, and that was really helpful for me to debug the, the a lot of problems which we, which we had recent, uh, with the chat. So so monitoring is a key actually of this project. Um, I put together some statistic to show that we build this and actually someone is using it. Um, <laughs> currently, on the our, uh, on our, our, this is a global statistic, so this is number of unique users uh, per week, uh, which seems to, to be pretty big. And what is really <coughs> exciting for us, it's growing all the time. Uh, we actually never have like time when it stopped growing or stopped shrinking for a long time, which is really really exciting. Um, here's the a little bit different statistic. We took our top thousand wiki, we measured how many contributors is in the, those top thousand wikis, and this is thirty four thousand and eleven thousand of those users are using a chat so each uh, one of of three user use the chat before he he makes an edit or in the meantime uh, which I think it's pretty interesting um, this is a, a statistic which I mentioned before the number of the maximum daily number of users who are connected and this is the number of messages per hour sent by chat um, OK, so besides the statistic, we kind of figured out that the user really like our features because they do their own stuff. Uh, they extending it. Uh, on the Wikia, admins can customize JavaScript, so you can add interesting stuff. I, I just pick pick few of them. Uh, one of the things which you can do is customize demo icons. So South Park Wiki, for example, have these demo icons for the chat. This is a My Little Pony Wiki. Uh, 
Uh, this is pretty interesting. Someone put this this funny switch switch to night mode. It's nothing nothing big, but I I really like it. <laughs> yeah, and also. <laughs> Uh, also, guys from Call of Duty Wiki, they build this ch chat statistic. Uh, they gather the statistic about what is going on on the chat. But most interesting, they somehow analyze the text and figure out in who is who. And apparently, this guy asking too much question. Um, this guy is this guy is happy. Uh, yeah, happy and then sad as well. Yeah, it's 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 a really funny thing. So and that was that's actually Saktash. Oh, that's actually our Saktash. Yeah, Show yeah. yourself. Call of Duty. <laughs> from from Call of Duty Wiki and also My Little Pony Wiki. <laughs> which which uh, sound weird? There's which, on Wikia. It's completely um, which so sounds mysterious. Sounds to be a weird combination, but this is avatar <laughs> of one guy from the Call of Duty. His name is Call of Duty Four, and that's his avatar, My Little Pony. <laughs> sort of this unholy um, alliance that happened. Yes. Um, I've seen that same thing for um, free node base, the Wolf Game channel. Um, so I'm it's not sure if it's it built a wiki. It's, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's not wiki specific. It's not a wiki specific staff program, but I have a bot that I, you, I uh, kind of chat your website and everything. Okay. Um, but we love it. We want to start putting this out. Okay, so that. That's the people who work on that. That's tons of people, actually. Uh, and everyone seems to be pretty happy with doing it. Um, so questions? Yes? The first, the first question I got, uh, are you guys planning on releasing all of that fun stuff for the community to make use of? We actually released that uh, in the Wikilabs, which means that anyone of our, our users can well, they might be talking about like the yeah, open like the source, day and, the day and night chat kind of stuff. Is that what you mean? Like the sort of the fun? No, I was actually I was talking about the actual chat, uh, chat functionality itself. They, they, the code, yeah. 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 Oh yeah, code, 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 code yeah. is uh, code is released. Um, we have an open SVN. Uh, what is also interesting, uh, it's it's implementing in the way that you can <coughs> actually easily start using it with different system than MediaWiki okay. and different backend. I mean, it requires work, but it's it's pretty doable. And different backend than, okay. than no, no, not different backend than Node, but different database than Redis. Okay. So you can put it in MySQL stack, for example, if you don't have a choice. Um, your Redis code, uh, is that also available? No, Redis is actually, um, Redis is actually an application which we didn't run, we just no, used I'm, I'm not sure, uh, Yeah, everything is, everything is available. Uh, it um, came after the, I, I will show you the SVN. Any other questions? Yes. Yes, that guy was first. How long, how long did it take you guys to develop it? I will leave this answer to Danny. Uh, Keep track of stuff like we're that. We're still developing. <laughs> <laughs> it's been, you have no idea. No, we went through, um, I think about six different, like six different sprints, six different iterations um, to get it to where it is right now. Uh, probably it was, I think, three, four months for the initial kind of few things to get it out on the site. And then since then, we've come back to it a few times. So probably overall, I don't know, maybe like six, seven months, um, but kind of spaced out over about a year and a half. Andrew. Yeah, so I'm curious about how, how this has actually ended up being used. So I'm wondering, do you find that people um, use it to discuss on like a local article what to do with the article? Do you find that people it's tend to keep it open all the time, like Facebook chat, and just sort of do it in the background? I'm just curious. It's interesting. I mean, maybe I will leave this answer to <coughs> our users. <laughs> Who is using a chat here? <laughs> OK. So one answer. How is that used? Well, um, I'm actually Tim. I'm with the staff, so I'm in a lot of chats. And um, traditionally, it, it depends actually on the culture of the wiki in general. Obviously, we have a couple hundred thousand wikis, so every wiki has a very different culture. I would say that some of the more entertainment, um, younger audiences like Twilight or Glee, they're, they are using it primarily for chat functionality. Um, I'm sure Daniel can say, but Call of Duty wikis, maybe they're more canon wikis, what traditional canon wikis, they are using it to talk about what's actually happening on the site as it happens. So it, it really depends on the culture of each wiki individually. 
As you see here, actually, the people are asking about the problems that they have on the side of the on the community central. That's our like main main challenge. They're also apparently pointing out that witches aren't real. <laughs> so, just in case, that's, that's the excitement of real-time uh, communication. You can find out stuff like that. Late breaking news. Um, I know also I, I'm the founder and admin on Muppet Wiki. Um, and we don't use chat because um, as much as some of these other wikis do, like Glee or My Little Pony. Um, but there have definitely been times when there are a few of us who are all kind of working on the same article and stuff on, at the same time. And especially if there's an edit conflict, we'll often sort of post on another person's wall and say, hey, could you jump into chat for a second and let's talk about that? So it's been really useful. Um, that kind of stuff doesn't happen for us all the time or you know, sometimes it's just for chatting, but there definitely are some great moments when we can use it to, to figure out something that we're trying to work on together. Oh yeah. Oh, also, one one of the interesting cases is uh, our actually application development. Now we have this thing which is called um, community council, and Dan is we working currently on this feature called forum. Dan is is meeting those guys on the chat. They they discussing what direction we should take during the the building this 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 feature. Yeah, we've got on, on our community council, um, we do office hours. Is it once a week or twice a week? Around there, once, once or twice a week, where a product manager who's working on a feature can talk to some of the Wikia users who are really interested in learning about new features or giving feedback. So we'll have these sort of, uh, you know, one hour session where we'll be there and people come and talk to us. So that's also been super helpful for us. Okay, uh, any other questions? Yes. I think that's true, yes. That's yes. bring the community together. I don't believe it does have such a big impact on the articles, yeah. Well, I think what he said, it's because Wikia is, is a, a large collection of small wikis, um, it's a thing that, that we really love about it, um, that Wikipedia is so enormous and important and amazing and all that, but like it's, it's hard, I think, um, to necessarily connect to the other people on Wikipedia who are interested in the same thing that you are. I think folks do that through wiki projects, but sometimes it's hard to kind of keep that together. Um, on our site, I know all the people who are writing on the Muppet Wiki. Um, the Call of Duty guys know th those people, and so each culture gets to um, kind of evolve on its own independently. But see, um. the chemistry is completely different. Mm -hmm. So what kinds of things are you seeing that's different? Well, obviously Wikipedia is a lot more structured. There's a lot more expectation. If you don't do something right, you're gone. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's also the, 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 you know, it's not only about chat. This is the, the you know, main difference between the, the Wikia and Wikipedia. Yeah, Wikia is for fun, <coughs> uh, and Wikipedia is a serious stuff. So it's... Serious. <laughs> I take I take Muppets very seriously. I know, <laughs> but it's still fun. <laughs> it is. I, I believe if you would start copying your articles from Wikia to, to Wikipedia, you would, would get bounced pretty fun. fast. I would have less fun, yeah. Um, any other questions? This gentleman in the back. Yes. Um, well, I use Wikia, and I find that I don't really like the default Wikia theme. I like I prefer Monobook or any of these special features like chat and like the thing you talked about yesterday. So we, with the, the this is interesting question. You can use uh, chat is kind of skin independence. So what you can do is actually set like if you will use Monobook skin, chat will br be broken. But what you can do is just set. Uh, use skin equal oasis in the chat window, and this this chat window will work correct, basically. So, came came after uh, I can show you how how to use the uh, the the, mo the chat on the monument. It's possible. Other questions? Maybe our time. Okay, I think. Oh, that would be last question. Yes. I was waiting for this question all this time. <laughs> I was waiting for this question all this time. 
I'm going to answer my favorite question. So, <laughs> it is a good question. Um, we really like the one of mo mo most important thing for us was actually the integrating the system with MediaWiki and with Jabber and infra in existing infrastructure that wouldn't be that easy. And also, we kind of wanted everyone use the same tool uh, to you know to access the chat. And with Jabber, some people would connect with something like it would be just just different feeling for for everyone. This, this is just unified and uh, very integrated with MediaWiki. I love, by the way, that we're talking, and I have no idea what they're talking about up there. It could be anything. Um, I hope it's great. Uh, yeah, the, we spent actually a lot of time trying to figure out should we use IRC as a base or Jabber or create, build our own stuff on Node.js. And uh, as a product manager, the single killer feature that said we have to make our own is that I said we need to have, as soon as you turn it on in our Wikia labs and it's now live on a site, the first person who goes in there, if they're an admin, they need to be an admin in that chat. Um, we've got 200,000 wikis who could be turning it on and if they need to go ask somebody from staff, from the community team, to make them an admin in their chat, it's not scalable, it's just, and it's not a good experience for the users. Um, so we kind of went through, like, can we do that in IRC? Can we do that in Jabber? And it turned out that we couldn't, or at least couldn't very easily. And so that was really the, the number one reason why we said, it, it's gotta work that way. If you go in and you're not an admin already, they're not gonna enjoy this. I have time for one more question. <coughs> yes. Danny, it appears that you made a fundamental change that that really ought to be part of the architecture that the first time I'm interested in this is ownership. And it's completely different concept. Is that ownership is not allowed? Um so what you repeat well, what you Yeah, it was I mean, kind of quiet. Um, he was saying it seems like it's a, it's also a difference in culture um, between Wikia and Wikipedia that somebody who is an admin doesn't necessarily um, on Wikipedia feel that same sense of ownership, um, and that is true. Uh, partly because just it's so big, and there are I believe on Wikipedia like a couple thousand admins, um, fifteen hundred admins uh, on our on our wikis. Um, for a real active wiki, it might be you know, a few hundred regular contributors and then maybe five or six admins um, who often have spent a long time kind of building the site and working on it. So it is, because it's more of a feeling that like here's this little group, um, the admins I think do feel some more ownership over it um, than they do with Wikipedia. And that's on Wiki. Okay. All right, thank you guys so much. Thank you very much. So I'm going to be showing you guys one of my uh, experimental little projects, which uh, I hope you'll think is fun. Uh, so doing embedded scripting for uh, potentially all kinds of fun stuff, maps, graphs, games, whatever. Um, as you probably noticed, our users are really, really creative. When we give them good tools, people make good stuff. Um, but what kind of tools do we have available? Uh, you know, we've got templates in Wikitext, which have the advantage that anyone can create them. Anyone can edit them, anyone can use them, but they're limited to what the wiki can do. Uh, so you're not able to do anything really interactive. Uh, people have done really clever stuff like uh, using templates to create a chess game by uh, creating a chess game uh, or a chess uh, board layout. Uh, and then you can put all the pieces in there and then you can play it by editing the template. Uh, but that's really, really awkward. <laughs> so most of the stuff that uh, people do in templates is uh, for presentation uh, and is relatively static. Uh, then we have user scripts. Uh, you can write your own JavaScript uh, and CSS, customize it into the wiki, totally do anything that you want, but it's only for you. No one else can see it. Uh, it's possible to share user scripts between users, but you have to sort of opt into it. You have to go, okay, I really trust this guy's script. Uh, I'm going to go ahead, set them up, and uh, let it run. And, uh, you know, that's great, but it does have the security disadvantage that uh, if so and so's script turns out to have some horrible problem, that, uh, for instance, maybe it takes over your administrator account and deletes every page on the wiki, uh, <laughs> it can do that. And that's not something we necessarily want. 
Uh, and third, we have Site JavaScript and Gadgets, which are global. Uh, so they get to apply to everything and everybody, but they can only be edited for security reasons by site administrators. So you know, what can we do that maybe hits all three of those things? Uh, give us the full HTML and JavaScript stack. Let us do interactive stuff, um, but also be available to anybody. Uh, and because uh, we haven't had that, a lot of the tools uh, that people have created have been uh, more kind of power user stuff uh, that you have to opt into. Uh, there's a lot of curation tools, editing tools, uh, a few things that are built for readers, but primarily it's uh, very editor-centric. So um, one of the things that I've started to figure out is embedding. Uh, now, I started actually getting interested in um, embedding between websites when I was working at StatusNet doing um, social software. So if you go on, uh, onto um, Identica, <coughs> it's uh, pretty much you know like Twitter, etc. Uh, you can go ahead, post a link to something, funny YouTube video, for instance. Uh, we're able to use a O-embed protocol. Uh, so the StatusNet server goes, fetches that page. Uh, gets information about the page, goes, okay, I, now I have a thumbnail image uh, and some arbitrary HTML that uh, lets me actually play the video. Now, the problem with, of course, putting arbitrary HTML into your website is, again, you've got that security problem. So in StatusNet, we only use the thumbnail because it's safe. But, <clears throat> come on, thumbnails, thumbnails are boring. They don't do anything. They don't move. They don't interact when you click on them. They just kind of suck. So what's the basic problem that we have? The problem is uh, that the web browser security model, if you have code that's in the same origin, uh, which is on the same domain and uh, the same <laughs> port and you know, a few other particular details, uh, two separate windows or in the same window, they can completely access each other's data. Uh, and that's actually pretty convenient when you know, you're know you inventing JavaScript and frames and stuff back in the 90s, uh, because then you can have you know one part of your website that's in a frame up here uh, interact with part of your website that's down here in another frame, and that's pretty good. But uh, that's not so good when uh, you have security issues. So there is a security model, which is good. So separate <laughs> websites cannot contact each other. There's just nothing they can do. Uh, they can't get at each other's variables. They can't get at each other's uh, domain object model. Uh, there's just nothing direct. But it turns out that there is an interface uh, which all modern browser browsers support, which is called window.postmessage. Uh, and this allows any window or frame from any site to send a message to any other window or frame from any other site as long as you can get a reference. Um, and uh, the advantage of this method is that it's totally opt-in on the other side. Uh, yes? The same domain, so... These are separate domains here. But the, looks, the string is the same. Uh, that's because I'm dumb and I forgot to update that slide properly. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try and fix that later. So pretend that's a different domain. It's a different color, at least. <laughs> So you send a message from here, and uh, if this other domain doesn't know how to deal with messages, it'll just never see it. Uh, but if it does opt into the message system uh, and has an on message event, then it'll take the message and it gets to look at it and go, OK, do I actually trust this or not? And then decide how to deal with it itself. So um, one thing that you can do, of course, is you don't have to have separate windows, necessarily. You can have a parent window and a child iframe. Uh, now, iframes are a uh, you know, fun little thing that uh, do get used a lot for embedding. So for instance, when you see a YouTube video embedded on you know, any given site, chances are it's actually an iframe. <laughs> Uh, even if the way that you embed it is uh, with some kind of magic script thing, that script will actually load up an iframe. Um, and we can uh, use the fact that we know the parent-child relationship between the parent window and the child frame to uh, make sure that things are secure. Uh, so if you're in this little frame and you get a message, you know for a fact that it came from the parent frame. 
uh, because you have a reference to your parent window and you have a, re a reference to the window that the message came from. And you can go, okay, those are the same. I trust this guy or I don't trust this guy or whatever. Uh, and they can send a message back and the parent window knows, okay, this is the child window. This is the same window I'm expecting. It's not somebody else. So you can have uh, nice, clear, direct stuff. Um, what the hell did this slide mean? <laughs> Allow me to show my presenter notes. Yeah, okay, that didn't help. Anyway, iframes are good. Uh, so, yes, yes, now I remember what it means. How do you actually get yourself an iframe? Uh, the problem is you can't just create an iframe on your own site because then you're going back to that security model where everything can access everything. Uh, what you want to have is an iframe that's on a separate site, but that you can <coughs> control. So how do you go ahead and do that? Uh, I figured out that the simplest way is actually to just create a very simple website that does nothing but say, I am an embeddable iframe that can accept stuff. Uh, so I have what is probably the simplest Wikimedia Labs project. It is one HTML file. Uh, if you go to embed-sandbox.wmflabs.org, you'll see it. Uh, and it just will tell you if you go to it directly in a browser, this is just for embedding, go see the documentation. But it can do much more exciting things when you actually start injecting code into it. So, uh, let's see. <coughs> Yes? How do you grant this documentation? Ah, that's an excellent question. We'll get to that shortly. So I have a couple of demos. Uh, one is a demonstration of uh, drawing Mandelbrot set fractal. Uh, so if you go to the uh, Wikipedia Mandelbrot set page, you'll find that it has a picture. And the picture is very nice, but that's all it is. It's just a still picture. Um, if you go ahead, though, and make something interactive, suddenly it gets more exciting. You can go ahead, zoom in, pan around, and go, yeah, that really is an interesting, cool fractal. Duh, what else do we have? I also have a Pythagorean theorem demo, uh, which shows uh, you know the classic uh, square method of um, calculating the hypotenuse of an uh, what's the appropriate term right triangle. Um, but instead of just a picture, let's go ahead and make this interactive. Let's let you change the size of the triangle, and then show how the uh, let's make that slightly smaller. There we go how that actually fits. So you can go ahead and follow the calculation as you change the size of the item. You're going to make every small child's math homework so much easier. I know, it's going to be cool. <laughs> and uh, another fun one that actually based on, slightly on an old DOS game that I used back in uh, my younger days. Uh, so this is actually taking an SVG file of uh, the entire United States of America with uh, all the states as individually addressable objects, uh, which means we can just go ahead and import that, and we can highlight each individual state. And uh, so this is a simple little, uh, you know, guess the name of the state game. So we know that one's Alaska. Boink. That one is Idaho. Ah, Florida. It's a silly place. California. Yes. Yay, good what times. You if you get it wrong, really it uh, turns red. Hawaii? That's not Hawaii. That's Ohio. <laughs> so uh, I actually want to show you how this uh, actually works inside. Alamawa, I said. Sorry? Alamawa. Really? Alamawa. <laughs> oh, well, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's a long story. <laughs> Apparently, oh, I got one. Actually, I think it's probably a very short story. <laughs> so, how does this actually work? You know, you have some JavaScript code, but how do you get it in there? Okay, 
So basically what we do is we use that window post message interface just twice so far. Uh, potentially we can use it more to do fancier things like re requesting images. Uh, but once the iframe is loaded and ready, it's loaded up jQuery, library, a couple other things, it sends a message to its parent that says, okay, I'm ready, go ahead and send me something. Uh, and then he the uh, parent window says, okay, here's a big chunk of JavaScript, go run it. And uh, the iframe says, okay, I'll go ahead and run that. And uh, it goes ahead and it runs it. So because the uh, post message interface is not uh, restricted to the same domain, we get the message across, but because we verify that it comes from the parent frame, we know that it's safe to use. So let's show how this actually goes about. Since you're dealing with a marginally paranoid group of individuals when it comes to computer stuff, um, is, is one of the function out, one of the requirements for this to be functional that the JavaScript going to be in open source of some sort? Well, or at least clearly visible. Uh, the advantage is the source is actually on Wiki. Uh, so in theory, you know, you could, uh, actually my first iteration uh, of this project, I was doing off-site JavaScript. Uh, so you would say, I have a page somewhere over here that is embeddable that has scripts in it. Um, but then that's exactly one of the problems with it, is that it's separately hosted, it may disappear at any time, it might not be open source. Uh, is basically the equivalent of just putting a um, uh, a wiki uh, or uh, a HTTP link at the bottom of the article and saying go to this website. You know, it it gives you something, but it's not really part of the wiki. Now, so, when you say on wiki, are you talking about if it's if the program is executable in English Wikipedia? Mm -hmm. Is it going to be on English Wikipedia or Meta or uh, MediaWiki? Uh, at the moment, it wants to be within itself. So this is on my test wiki. Uh, the actual page itself um, just has one little call, embed script. Uh, you can either put the JavaScript directly in there, uh, or you can put it in another page, uh, which is what I did for convenience here. And uh, it's just another wiki page that you can go ahead and edit. So uh, it's basically the same as gadgets, user scripts, etc., in that it's right there, built into the wiki. Um, so if the wiki gets uh, backed up, the wiki gets restored, the wiki gets moved, you know, it'll still come with it. So uh, that little US states game, uh, what I actually did was I took a uh, HTML file, or not HTML file, SVG file, which I have a link to, uh, which is sitting on commons. Um, so there's a lot of uh, maps that are based on this map, uh, and there are similar maps for other countries and other regions. <coughs> Uh, and it's, you know, it's nice and detailed, and it's super convenient because it separates out each individual state and territory uh, with its own ID, um, which makes it super, super easy to customize. So uh, since we don't have direct access to it, I actually cut and pasted the SVG file literally into the source code. Uh, it's a very long line. And uh, then I just did a list of the state's names. Uh, I'm sure I spelled a couple of them wrong. I'm sorry. And uh, some simple code to uh, shuffle arrays. And uh, then basically, you know, this here is the entire uh, actual game code which uh, goes ahead and just selects some states, says, okay, I'm gonna sh highlight this state, I'm gonna pick these state names, puts them into a list, sets up event handlers for uh, you know, how, to, uh, how to handle clicking. So if you uh, click the correct guess, it finishes the round, moves on to the next round. If you do the incorrect, it flashes the red. Uh, you know, this could get a lot fancier. You could add different modes. Uh, you know, you could add a, uh, um, a mode to sh uh, show you the state's name so you can practice beforehand. 
or switching around to giving you some names and letting you select something. Um, but more importantly, you could very easily take the same code uh, and switch out this US map for, say, a map of Europe, and that list of states for a list of countries in Europe, uh, and you could have the exact same thing working for, guess, the states or the uh, countries in Europe. So it could use some polish. Uh, it's still pretty experimental. Uh, right now, the frame size is fixed at 64480. Uh, obviously, you want that to be flexible. Um, right now, it does autoplay, which is potentially a uh, partial security risk in that you could be um, revealing people's IP address to some other website. Uh, so it might be nice to have more of a click-to-play system like videos are, uh, in which case you need to figure out some way of doing thumbnails, however. So that's an additional thing. Um, another uh, security improvement that I'd like to do is using wildcard subdomains. Um, because going back to that wall of doom, if you're actually on the same domain, you don't have the wall of doom. So uh, two JavaScript item or JavaScript uh, programs that are embedded in the same frame, or rather in different frames of the same domain, would still be able to access each other, uh, which we wouldn't want to do. But if we forward you from, uh, you know, the embed sandbox to embed sandbox one two three four five six seven, and uh, the next frame gets embed sandbox three six eight nine two nine whatever, uh, then they're going to be separate, and they're not going to be able to interfere with each other. And uh, additional debugging tools. Also, I want to get in there. Uh, one problem right now uh, with the way that the JavaScript is being embedded. Uh, is that it's kind of tricky to debug because you don't have a source URL. It gets evaluated. Uh, but it's actually very simple to uh, provide a URL for a uh, wiki page. Um, so future versions are going to be easier to use with the in-browser debugging tools. Uh, so that's pretty much it for the moment. Um, presentation is available on uh, the page with my other stuff at brianb.com. Uh, any questions? Lots of questions. Yes. Uh, so I noticed you're using jQuery in there. Uh, yes. Is that just because jQuery is already in MediaWiki, or is there the opportunity to basically bring in any arbitrary JavaScript framework? You can use any arbitrary JavaScript framework. I just threw in jQuery because I like it. Okay. Awesome. Wouldn't that have to live in the child frame? Yes, it does live in the child frame. Uh, so it's actually completely separate from the MediaWiki framework that's, uh, or the JavaScript frameworks that are running in MediaWiki itself. Yes. And you may, how, how do you keep uh, somebody from writing malicious code within MediaWiki to go ahead? And, uh, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, there, uh, there is the potential to, for instance, create something that does a denial, a denial of service attack, uh, slows down your browser, um, maybe tries to exploit browser bugs. Uh, that is a potential problem. Uh, but that's the same potential problem that you have with linking to external sites. Uh, so it's a trade-off that I think is reasonable to make. Back there. I'd be very interested in trying to embed actual interactive 3D graphics, and there are plenty of Java programs to do that. Is, is it possible in this system to actually get that functional? Absolutely. Um, one of the advantages of this is that because you have full access to the HTML and JavaScript stack, uh, you can go ahead, uh, you could use a uh, Java applet, uh, as long as that's available. You can also use um, WebGL in some of the newer where, browsers. Where does it have to be available? In the browser plugin. In the browser plugin, yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, you, you can take full advantage of it. So they have to actually yeah, well, um, Java's kind of going out, uh, so it's not always on by default anymore. The applet, not just Java. Yeah. Yeah, you, you would have to host the applet somewhere offsite currently. Uh, in theory, you could upload things in somewhere, but uh, that's not quite done yet. Uh, yes? Values into the JavaScript, like 
Yeah, one of the uh, next things that I want to do, uh, repeating the question, can this be used in uh, conjunction with templates to uh, inject new values into the JavaScript? And the answer is yes, soon, hopefully. Um, so back to, where is that page? Ah, that's too big. That's too small. <laughs> Yay. So right now, this is uh, going to an external script, uh, but you can also embed stuff in there. Uh, so I want to be able to make sure that you can actually do both. So for instance, you could uh, have a common script that you use in multiple places, and then put additional data for the script to use inside this part. And that you could do with a template. And it looks like it's about time. No more questions? Right, hello, it's panel time. Um, so the topic of today's panel is small process helpers. Um, I actually originally had this as a presentation. Um, but I sort of realized that I don't actually know all the answers, so I kind of wanted to get other perspectives from around the room. And the impetus for this was um, when Heather and Seiko, Seiko's up the back there, say hi to her. Um, when Heather and Seiko were working on um, their Wikipedia Tea House, which is an awesome project um, to help uh, acclimatize new people to the Wikimedia movement. Um, when they were working on that project, they really wanted a new way of adding to uh, of adding a question to the tea house that didn't need a lot of, a lot of knowledge, and it was a bit of a teaching moment, um, and that uh, that was actually quite successful, and it's been adapted and used all over the place. So the question is, how can we apply this to other processes? I just want to get a feeling for the room. How many people here are editors on a wiki project, and how many people here have used a process on a wiki project, like posting to a talk page, nominating an article for deletion, something like that, created an article. How many people think that, pro how many people think that process could be improved? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so basically what we're talking about today is how we can use technology, particularly little JavaScript gadgets, to actually make those processes easier to use. We currently on Wikipedia, I think we have a four-step, three-step process for nominating an article for deletion. Um, now, it can be argued that it, sh that, there sh that it would be good to make that easier. It can also be argued that it should be difficult to nominate an article for deletion. So I want to talk about the applications we have and, um, and how those might be used. So yeah, I'm, curi I'm curious to hear uh, processes that we might be able to improve. Does anybody have any thoughts? Yes, you were first. Oh, go ahead. I'd love to hear it. <laughs> hey. Hi. Uh, at the Spanish Wikipedia, where I uh, work the most, uh, we have a contest called the Wiki, Wiki Reto. Uh, well, the, uh, it's the same that as always, you know, people just edit articles, Wikify articles, and win points for that as well. The process was, was pretty uh, tough because everyone had to update some tables with scores. Uh, someone had to unify tables uh, at, at the scores. So we wanted to automatize the process. So I, I, I created a PHP script that made everything. People just had to uh, have a very simple list with their articles and run the script and the, the script will do everything, uh, create the tables, create uh, the rankings, a lot of stuff. The problem is that currently there's no way uh, to, to run the script from Wikipedia, so I had to upload it in my own server because I don't e either have a two-server uh, account. So yes, that, that's the way we do it. Um, we are, uh, uh, um, it was, it was, nice to implement that because everyone is happy now. So that's the spirit. <laughs> yeah. That, uh, and, and it also added a lot of participation to the contest because as it is now e very easy to participate. Uh, a lot of people want to do it. So 
I think this is very important. It, it will be really, really nice to have some sort of system that makes things uh, easier because it, doesn't no, it does not only uh, makes things easier to the people that make the process, but actually uh, encourages people to do it, uh, well, new, book, new people to do it. Excellent. That's really great to hear. Um, so I guess, yes, Brian? No, it's just Sven. Sven. Ah, uh, yes. Um, there is a slight downside to using <coughs> clever tools um, to help with all these processes, which was revealed recently. Um, right now on Wikipedia, to do just about anything with, with deletions or a whole host of other things, it is a two-step process. One, click twinkle. Two, watch the magic happen. The, the problem, of course, is that when it occasionally goes down, when twinkle goes down, all the people who have been using Twinkle suddenly forget how to do anything. Um, so, <laughs> so I think that when we, when, we, when we have a situation where we are so comfortable with, so reliant on these tools, we become overly dependent on them. Um, so, so I think it would be very interesting to, to look at it not only as getting the tools to make it easier, but also getting the underlying processes to be easier as well. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk a bit, a bit a bit about that because process. I mean, th those of you who know anything about the curation toolbar stuff, or we're here for other topic. We had a panel yesterday, and we went through that. Some of the mechanisms that we're building, like a foundation supported version of Twinkle, effectively. Um, these are uh, when we were doing that, when we were designing it, uh, we had to do a lot of like research into what I would just call the bowels of hell. Um, which is mostly about all the different processes that, that, that we do, uh, even if it's just you know tagging something with citation needed. Um, so we have these uh, really scary workflow diagrams um, that uh, I think some of them are up on Commons. Uh, the actual process to create an article is something like there's like s something along the lines of 500 bubbles and, and 600 arrows that it could go through. Uh, and this follows everything from I'm an IP editor then I, and I need to do that. Deleting articles are no different. It's still just as complicated. So uh, I am very keen, personally, on the idea of reducing process cruft uh, because we know for a fact that process cruft actually drives away editors uh, because they don't understand it and then they feel stupid. It's not that they can't understand it, it's just they get frustrated and they just run away. So having an automated tool is great to handle these hard processes or these difficult workflows but you have to know the tool exists, which is the other thing. Because I don't think most people, new editors, are even aware that Twinkle is, is, even, is even existing. Which is one of the deals why, with the tea house, we enabled this gadget globally for everybody. We just, we just did it. Because these were new editors who did not understand talk pages, and we wanted to have a simple way for them to, to, to engage. Stephen, it looks like you want I, to talk. I think it's interesting, though, because um, <coughs> Sven's point is important because um, there's a like somewhat non not obvious line between gadgets and tools that are process helpers that teach you how the process works as you use them, and gadgets like Twinkle that automatically do every step for you and obfuscate the process, like um, so that when it comes time to like teach others how to use it or like tell explain it to someone else, you can't because the tool just says loading page, editing page thing, doing this thing, like it. it speaks in like computer language at you as it's going through so you just click a button and it doesn't show you what's going on whereas with the tea house gadget you enter in text it says please enter your message here you click save and you see the text appear on the page so you understand the process of what's going on you're posting to a talk page it's a public post that other people can see and that you're wanting people to respond to like just from seeing how it works it's teaching you what the process is and what you're doing by the way, when folks want to say something, feel free to raise your hand and you'll actually get yeah, it. We, we, got, we got no ceremony here, man. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and the Heather just made a really good point. You should, you should say that out loud. Well, actually, I think it, and, and Andrew added this to the Tea House gadget, which is the one that lets you ask a question. It actually requires that you put in the four tildes for your signature before it lets you post the question. So that adds to the teaching moment that Stephen was talking about. 
Of course, you shouldn't have to add the four tildes anyway. But <laughs> well, yeah. well, you have to at now. So. At the moment, yeah. Echo and flow. Echo and flow. <laughs> anyway, um, one of the other points that I wanted to make is that uh, I think one of the points that I think Stephen and Brandon and Sven touched on is that Twinkle and those tools are great. Well, let's, let's work with that. Um, <laughs> Twinkle and those tools are, are, are great if you have them enabled. And it takes a certain level of knowing what, knowing what you're doing, knowing where you are in Wikipedia. Actually, show of hand, how many people here have not heard of Twinkle, the tool? Right. Wow. Right, yeah. So we should probably explain that Twinkle is a right. tool that automates a lot of, a lot of these, um, a lot of these uh, processes uh, within Wikipedia. For example, nominating an article for the deletion, reverting yeah. an edit. Yeah, so it, uh, you know, the process of like, if you wanted to nominate an article, you just, it's, it's a little thing up in the corner, a little gadget, and you just, you're on the page and you, pull down this list and you say delete this page for this reason done and then it will like create templates and place them on people's user pages and talk pages for you it'll automatically open up the uh, article for deletion system and whatever now this also by the way that the, the entire thing about like the automated part of it is actually very scary too uh, because I think a lot of times people forget what's actually happening behind the scenes when they do that, that like that they are slapping a warning template on somebody's page and that is a very scary experience. Um, and I think that maybe sometimes forgetting the fact that you're saying mean things to new users is uh, a big problem. But for uh, lots of reasons, that John is gonna talk about this. Well, no, no, actually, I plus one on that. But okay. I just wanted to underscore the point that Andrew uh, just made because I don't think it can be made loud enough. Uh, you don't just to have, have to have some familiarity with Wikipedia and the way it works to know about Twinkle. You have to have what for a normal user of Wikipedia, a reader or an early editor, like a ridiculous and almost unattainable amount of familiarity. There's no, I mean, you have to dig deep to find Twinkle. And the fact that, you know, these things are second nature to us. We know where these tools are. Many of us do, a lot of us don't. Um, but these, these add-on and, and uh, uh, manually enabled tools, user scripts, things like that, um, that you have, to, you have to add yourself, like this is, this is completely obscure. This is this is a foreign country to uh, a new user of Wikipedia or a reader. So, having something that's globally enabled is is kind of the only way you can introduce people to these these functionalities. It's not quite the only way to uh, enable it by default, but how about <coughs> not burying the gadgets like on uh, on a tab in oh, the preferences? So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. The preferences screens. Yeah, no. Um, that's a rant for a whole other day. I mean, I have a bunch of gadgets, right? Which right. Uh, uh, which I spend a lot of time on developing, and people will probably never see them. I mean, we've. We, some of them are enabled by default, and that's great, right? Uh, but the, the ones that are not enabled by default, uh, it's like a, a small percent fraction ever or looks at those. Right. Yeah, the, the preferences page is, is probably a bit out of scope for, for what we're talking about here, but I, I feel your pain. Thank you. Yeah, the fact that you have to actually go digging for this and that there's, it's just a, a list. It's not like mm -hmm. these are the ones that most users use, it's not. Yeah. Anyway, let's not get that right. Yeah. yeah. Is was there another comment over there? I, I seem to remember seeing two hands in that general region. I think I was just stretching. Just <laughs> stretching. <laughs> okay. Andrew, can I say a bit? Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Peter. Um, I just want to say that I use Twinkle all the time, and it's great. But I mean, yeah. people don't know about it. It's not. It's not well documented. It's fairly well documented. It's just finding out about it. I don't know how many people know. I'm working on a project to improve the help pages, but I mean, we don't introduce new users to Twinkle. Most people seem to just find it because they see someone else using it. And we don't. <laughs> Potentially the, for good reason. The other prob big problem I have with Twinkle is that even once you've got it installed, it's obscure. Like this is, this is, it just gives you this tab at the top which says TW, and then there's a load of different options which are all abbreviations and acronyms. <laughs> yeah. 
So I think it would be a much better approach if we could integrate these things into the processes more, make it more context sensitive, rather than bundling everything into one mega <coughs> tool like Twinkle. Like have the people who work in these processes like AFD, have them like maintaining it and having it appear on AFD pages and stuff. So I, I have a question related to that, which is um, of the editors in the room, how many people were aware that m most of the gadgets that are enabled on Wikipedia's were actually enabled like by local admins and they were probably written by volunteers, that we, they weren't written by the foundation. So maybe the majority? Okay, I think that's, that's one of the most important points I think about all of this process helper gadget things so that you don't have to wait for a developer to enable an extension or for the foundation to build something, but that like any, if you can find like an admin or anyone who will enable this gadget for you, it's like a one step process, you know, to like figure those things out. Now, if it's something that's particularly controversial, of course it might have to function like any other community. Yeah, exactly. Um, but like for all of the complaints and the things that come up with like, you know, obfuscated tools like Twinkle, it's also incredibly powerful to allow the community to like enable these process helpers on their own without waiting for a gatekeeper outside of their community. We had a comment over here br just briefly. Yeah, I, I have no idea what Twinkle is or most <laughs> our gadgets really. Are yeah. any of these things f for new users? I mean, so it sounds like all of them are for people who know how to use a site and well, are slapping like messages that are really scary. It, 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 um, it, it, so it depends. Some of them have, some of them are for like, like I know of one which was a, uh, a thing I designed in, in like an hour on a Sunday that I was bored about, which is like, you know, I thought that like go, go references, clicking on the, the little reference thing in, in the corner and then going all the way to the bottom and then having to click on something else to go see the reference was retarded. <laughs> so I was like, well, what if you just tapped it and there was a little pop-up hover and that had the reference right there? I'm like, well, that's easy and we can do that. So uh, a guy by the name of Yair Rand built it. Just He was bored and he built it. And uh, then we're trying to get, you know, he wants to get it enabled on the globe, on English Wikipedia globally, because it would be nice. Uh, but of course, it's extremely controversial. I have no idea why. Um, so that's like a reader-focused process helper, yeah. right? And it, Twinkle is one that's like a power user process. There's other ones that fall in between. So like one that I use a lot is, is navigation pop-ups. So you put your mouse over any page, and it'll put up a little list of of actually really cool information, so you don't actually have to go to that page. And none of, none of these are like enabled by default when you create a new account? There are some that are enabled by default, like there's a, uh, at least on English Wikipedia, one that showed up uh, uh, fairly recently was uh, a sandbox link in, in, your, in your header. So all of a sudden everybody has this My Sandbox. And uh, yeah, that, that is, like I'm not a cat, I don't. Um. <laughs> or you make an edit. That's not yeah, so there there are some that are enabled by default when you create an account and some that are not. And um, to be honest, I actually don't find there to be a lot of logic in the in the in the which could ones be are to turn the on which ones are on off. Uh, either one at side or um, yeah, I'll just try to keep that or there we go. Um, so uh, for you know some of the large user scripts like Twinkle, I know the code base is very complicated, and I'm sure there's lots <coughs> of developers working on them. I just thought about this. I don't know if it's in use, but are there people using, is there like a canonical GitHub repository or something for these more complicated scripts, or are people just editing on Wiki? I think they just edit on Wiki, Let's which see. is really scary. Yeah, that, Both. Is, that is really. Both. Twinkle is in a GitHub repository, okay, GitHub. but most of the smaller gadgets are not. Okay. Well, it just it worries me that, you know, because we want to do everything on Wiki, and Esperanza was explicitly shut down many years ago because its management processes were off Wiki and in secret, whereas you ideally, for coding purposes, you would want to do something in source control, and we don't have necessarily amazing, you know, branch-based hierarchies for doing that on Wiki. So I wonder if anyone's thought about something like that. That's a good idea. Development processes, yeah, that's development that process. really thought about. Maybe Terry Che could come up with something for us. Maybe Roan, who's in the back, and bug him about it. Yes, uh, actually, I'd, I'd like to hear from Roan about Resource Loader 2, because I think this is, is Roan around? Yeah, there he is. I'm here, I'm here. what's your question? Um, well, I'd, I'd just like, like a two-minute summary of the work you're doing on Resource Loader 2 and how that's going to apply to gadgets. 
All right, so I'll start by Put you on the spot. Go. <laughs> is it on now? Yeah. yeah. I'll start by plugging the actual presentation that we're giving on re about Reslurry 2 tomorrow. It's all 10. Um, but so yeah, there is a full presentation about this. But basically, what it's about is that we're um, making the management of gadgets easier. Because currently, gadget management can only be performed by administrators. And in order to do it, you have to edit a wiki page with absolutely terrible syntax that basically defines that this gadget is you know, composed of these pages, and it has this name, and has these properties, et cetera. And basically, we're throwing that wiki page with terrible syntax out the window and replacing it with an actually pretty user interface written in JavaScript and everything. And that's the most user visible change. The other major change is that we're going to be um, supporting sharing gadgets across wikis so that you can have a sh central gadget repository that all, wiki all wikis could use because, of a because a lot of duplication problems are rampant in the gadgets ecosystem right now. Gadgets.mediawiki.org? Something like that, maybe. A, a gadget commons. I think we have another question or comment somewhere. Yeah, we yes. Uh, I want. I wanted to comment. We can hear. We can hear. Okay, I wanted to comment about. Uh, I think it's important that new people work through some of these processes, like nominating an article uh, for deletion themselves the first time uh, through a new user's uh, process, the tutorials or whatever. Uh, it, Twinkle can cause a lot of problems. Yeah. I, I've desperately gone on a chase to to delete things and explain. It's handing a baby a loaded gun. The wrong place. Yeah, we don't want to. We, we uh, yeah. That's number one. That, that which brings it to some of the tutorials. Don't lead you to those tools. Uh, the tutorials for new users need to be rewritten in many cases. That's why people don't find the tools. And I think that's actually the point that. I've heard the most out of this uh, out of this is actually the accessibility issue and these things need to be um, they need to be enabled by default for everybody whether that's context sensitive or whether that's across the whole site we've only got a couple of minutes left so I'm wondering yes. if we can have a couple more comments and then maybe we can wrap up yeah. when I was hearing all this about tools I I'm reminded of uh, Mickey Mouse's Sorcerer's Apprentice. <laughs> and I, it worries me that you might be handing, you know, someone a lot of power who doesn't know how to use it. Are you going to have to wait for the water to come around and flush everything down the toilet before you know, shut them down? Well, I mean, there's some some of the tools like Twinkle very much are like superpowers, um, but most of them are not. Like you can't do any damage with navigation pop-ups. I mean slow your computer down maybe but uh, uh, twinkle is you know it, it, it is, is something that could cause damage if so in, in some ways maybe it is good that that one is difficult to find um, but I think overall uh, well first off I, I, I really agree with you I think that everybody needs to do this thing by hand once or at least understand the process as to what's going on even if that process is awful uh, I would prefer that we fix the processes and I would, <laughs> at the same time, I kind of don't want anybody to use Twinkle ever. So <laughs> I don't, I'm a little on the fence on both directions, so. Okay, one quick extra comment there and then we've <coughs> only got 30 seconds left or so, so better wrap up. Uh, while I agree to <coughs> that what you said that it, it will be nice that everyone uh, made the processes, well, manually at least once, <coughs> I think that fear of tools just come from well uh, clunky tools that are uh, that don't work as they are supposed to to and uh, inefficient documentation you know uh, when you when you use currently for, for example you use word or some kind of word processor you don't know how it manages text uh, and uh, the underlying data you know and it's fine uh, what I'm trying to say is that in, in the future when tools are more uh, well documented, well, well uh, implemented. I don't know how to say it. It won't. It, it won't be really necessary to make uh, that first step manually because, well, you won't be able to 
break something more than more than what how you will be able to break it manually. I'm not sure if I could explain myself, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I understand what you mean. Yeah, the okay. tool will prevent you from doing bad things. Yes, and and, yeah. the, and the tool won't won't do more damage than doing it manually, you know. Uh, I don't think you can you can do more damage with Twinkle than doing uh, at hand. So, well, that's it. Thank you. All right. Um any final comments? How much time do we have? No, we're, we're over again. We're over. All right, thank you very much. I realize I didn't do introductions at the start, um, <laughs> which is a little That's impolite good. of me. But anyway, if you want to talk more about this, come find us. We're all friendly. <laughs> Some of us. <laughs> Yeah, I was.